Welcome back to Pod Save the World. I'm Tommy Vitor. I'm Ben Rhodes. Ben, are you admiring the uh, images from the James Webb Space Telescope? I am I am captivated by the images of the early universe, Tommy. I'm not uh, going to lie. I, am. I love stuff like this. I absolutely love stuff like this. I will watch reruns of Cosmos while yeah. I fall asleep in bed every single night. But you're looking back in time. You're looking at the birth of the universe. That's very cool. It Yeah, it just kind of does put a lot in perspective. You know? It does yeah. put a lot in perspective. Um, yeah, yeah. Very cool. Check it out if you have not. Um, ben, we got a great show today. We do. There's a lot going on out there. I mean, it's it was weird Just last buckle week. Buckle up, guys. We yeah. did a bonus episode because of Boris Johnson's resignation. We could have done one the next day to talk about the assassination of former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Mm-hmm. Frankly, I think we both needed some more time to figure out like what the hell happened over there. Um, so we'll talk about that. We're going to talk about how protesters in Sri Lanka may have toppled the president. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll talk about President Biden's trip to the Middle East, why some people think it's a bad idea. The latest from Ukraine, Brittany Griner's case in Russia, uh, an incredible story about a British track star, a fake cricket match in India. Condi Rice gets a new job. Uh, Ooh, and then I haven't seen this, so I'm glad. I'm looking forward to the, it's good stuff. the, the live react to this. <laughs> and then Sean Bolton. Uh, and then, Ben, you're going to talk to our, our old friend, our White House colleague, Danny Russell, who's a brilliant Asia expert about all things Shinzo Abe, Japanese politics. What else? Yeah, I mean, people may have heard Danny on about China, but Danny's really a Japanese expert. Like, he was a diplomat in Japan. He's the number two, the DCM. Yeah, he was Japan. He was based in Japan for a long time. All the Obama years, including the four or five years that we overlapped with Shinzo Abe, he was the Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia, so he knew Abe really well, knows Japan really well. So we're going to break down, like, who Shinzo Abe was, what his legacy is, what does this event mean for Japan? So d- definitely, if you want somebody to unpack this, there's no no better American diplomat than Danny. One of the smartest, also funniest yep. people we got to work with. Danny and I had dinner out here in L.A. Like, it feels like 100 years ago. It must have been like 2019. And we saw the uh, Game of Thrones creators in the restaurant. Oh. That felt cool. Yeah, that's cool. That was very We were cool. at Night and Market. Great. Love that market. I get, uh, I get, I get yeah, my, some nods. my uh, takeout from there. I get some nods in the room. It's fantastic. Yeah. Just don't go too spicy. Uh, why don't we get to the news here, which is last Friday, uh, former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe was assassinated while speaking at a campaign event. Ben, I know you're going to focus on this in depth in your interview later with Danny, but I do think it's just worth quickly underscoring just what a towering figure he was in, in Japanese politics. Abe served as prime minister from 2006 to 2007. He resigned because of a medical issue, but later made a comeback and served as prime minister a second time from 2012 to 2020, which is the record for the longest interrupted tenure for a Japanese prime minister. That is particularly impressive when you know that during that period, Japan was just churning through leaders, like one a year. Yeah, we had had four in the first term (laughs) of the Obama administration. I mean, not good. Not a lot of stability in Japanese politics at the time. Um, Abe was conservative. He was uh, a nationalist. He fought hard to reform uh, Japan's constitution and give the Japanese military more flexibility and, frankly, allow it to be more aggressive and to deepen alliances with democracies like the U.S. and India and Australia. But generally speaking, I think it's fair to say that he is considered the most impactful post-World War II political leader in Japan, uh, which made the assassination, I think, all the more shocking. I mean, ben, I just wondered if you had any strong memories of working with Abe or meetings with him from the White House days. Yeah, I guess, and, you know, because Daniel will go through the legacy a bit. You know, this is, a, like you said, a huge figure who kind of stabilized Japanese politics and really dominated Japanese politics um, for much of the last 20 years. After a period of, like, really intense kind of economic stagnation, you know, he did kind of stabilize things. Mm-hmm. He played this much more sort of role globally. I guess what I'd say, leaving some of the legacy work to Danny, is, look, he was politically not in the same tradition or place as Obama, right? He was a right of center guy, more mm-hmm. nationalist guy. But, um, and I'm not just saying this, you know, in the aftermath of an assassination, like he, 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 despite some occasional friction points, really wanted Japan to be like a better, closer, more robust ally of the United States. If that sounds like foreign policy is being, you know, robust meaning like, he wanted to play a role in global events. He wanted to play a role in how we thought about the Asia Pacific. He wanted to help develop uh, new relationships between not just the U.S. and Japan, but all of our allies um, in, in the region. And, and my memories that stand out to me are, are really two. Uh, one is that in 2016, um, Abe and Obama went to Hiroshima together. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was the most one of the most powerful things I've ever been a part of. And, you know, 
it was this kind of moment of reconciliation and remembrance and kind of healing. Um, and, you know, that Abe really wanted that visit to happen. Obama was really moved by that visit. Um, hundreds of thousands of people turned out mm -hmm. um, to, to, to welcome Barack Obama to Hiroshima. Um, yeah, and the two of them gave these you know, incredibly poignant speeches. People, I encourage people to go check them out and laid a reef there at Ground Zero where the bomb fell. And then Abe came to Pearl Harbor um, in December 2016. I think he was the last foreign leader that Obama met with in Hawaii at Pearl Harbor. And, and Abe kind of closing that circle. And so he was a more complicated guy. You know, I've seen some people on the left, this guy was a nationalist, an ultra nationalist. You know, it's true that there are some, you know, elements that you might find troubling, like he visited this shrine to Japanese, uh, the Japanese war dead, which includes some right. um, war Far criminals. less reconciliation yeah. when it comes to conflicts with South Korea. But example. this is where I'm saying, like, he was more a little more complicated because yeah. the Hiroshima Pearl Harbor piece was a guy that that wasn't just celebrating the, the 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 nationalist past he was recognizing the complexity of history right and then the other thing i'd say is that uh, i went and i haven't talked about this i went to japan with obama in 2018 and obama was going there to like give a speech and it was like part of his bigger trip to asia trump is president mm -hmm. you know abe again right of center guy finds out we're going we had a three-hour sushi meal right with abe with abe at like a counter you know, like the kind of thing like you see in those documentaries. Was like, this the Jiro Love Sushi? I don't know if it's that place, but it was like a famous place, okay. right? Uh, um, and it was like sitting there with like dudes just like bringing out course after course after course of sushi. Um, it, maybe not three, but it was definitely two hours. One of the best meals of my life. And just was like incredibly gracious to Obama and, you know, talking about the past, talking about like some of the stuff that was going on with Trump, mm -hmm. like asking some advice and... So he was like, I, I just came away from that thinking like, you know, he was he was an interesting layered figure um, who had a huge impact on Japan. And he really did have like a like a, a decency about him, at least in all my dealings with him. Um, and and it, 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 the, the act of him being killed like that with what looked like a homemade gun, you just you never expect to see that in Japan. I mean, like, I think, like, one person was killed but with a gun in Japan. Yeah. Not it, by suicide, but killed, um, like, in the course of a year. Like uh, Very, very low yeah. levels of gun violence. Yeah, I mean, look, Abe seems like an incredibly savvy political actor, right? I yeah. Mean, he, he famously jumped on a plane right away when Trump was elected. I think brought him a gold-plated golf he did. club. He did, yeah. yeah. I mean, but, like, yeah. look, when you're the leader of a, a country that relies on the United States for a bunch of security assurances, like, you're going to kind of kiss up to the president yeah, like yeah. shit happens yeah no and it was like again complicated figure like i'm not suggesting he was without faulty but like uh hugely impactful and nobody you know nobody should go out like that obviously and and the people of japan you know it's like a it just got a huge shock to their body politic yeah to have it like go down like that yeah and they just had a big election which i'm sure you'll talk about with yeah. danny um you know sort of saying in the the general region listeners might have seen some pretty incredible images over the weekend out of sri lanka where protesters were st storming the official residence uh, of the office of the president president uh, rajapaksa people were sprawled out in his bed watching yeah. tv actually watching footage of the protests <laughs> yeah, that they were yeah. involved in on tv they were literally doing backflips into the presidential swimming pool it was pretty amazing another group burned down the prime minister's house a lot less funny not laughing at that. But these uh, scenes were the culmination of months, if not years, of frustrations about economic mismanagement and poor political leadership that have led the country from being, you know, really an economic success story to a truly desperate situation where in recent months um, the government has been rationing fuel, people can't get food, they can't find basic supplies, and President Rajapaksa's response has basically been denial. I think some of his supporters were attacking protesters, and then he tried to reshuffle his cabinet to make it look like he was making changes and sort of pulling power away from this dynastic family that he has, but it was all bullshit. This might be the end of the line for Rajapaksa and his family. Uh, over the weekend, the Speaker of the Sri Lankan Parliament said that the president is going to resign on Wednesday, so the day this podcast comes out, we record on Tuesdays, we'll see. The prime minister would normally take his place, but he resigned over the weekend as well. After his house was burned down. After his house was yeah. burned down. That's a good time to resign. Yeah. Which means the Speaker of the Parliament uh, should take over the presidency for like a month, I think. It's a it's a caretaker role. 
whoever gets the job inherits uh, a desperate economic situation. And basically, I mean, I guess, what do you do? You just go out and try to seek economic relief from yeah. India, the IMF, somebody immediately? Yeah, I, you know, you you appeal to, to international donors basically to stabilize things. I the, My reaction to this beyond just the insane images, like dudes, there was like the, the guy who jumped into the swimming pool from the roof. It looked like the scene. Um, almost from, famous. Almost swimming. famous. Yeah, like yeah. A, um, but first of all, the Rajapaksas, uh, the president and his brother, you know, these guys, like they, they, they win this brutal civil war against the Tamils, including with like atrocities at the end of that war um, in 2008, 2009. And then they never had a, pro- a program after that other than kind of, you know, treating the economy like their personal you know, fiefdom, essentially. Mm -hmm. And the things that stand out to me are are that one of the things that they did, uh, and this is not to pick on China, but I think it's it's an important point to hit. They did all these big infrastructure projects with China, where China would lend them, you know, the money to do these projects that were not really helping the broad economy. They were kind of vanity projects or developing this huge port, which, by the way, the Chinese might use someday as a a naval base. and it, yeah, it, an international it, airport named after the Rajapaksa family that yeah. is not being used, a cricket stadium in the yes. middle of nowhere that's barely used. Yeah, very expensive infrastructure projects. That, that again, like what good is that to the public? The, no, it's no. nice to have a nice cricket stadium, but it's not creating jobs, right? So um, it, it, there's a warning sign in that because there are other countries that have gone down this route of kind of financing big infrastructure projects with Chinese loans as a part of the Chinese-led Belt Road Initiative. And I think Sri Lanka should be a warning sign to some other countries that, you know, China wasn't there when um, they appealed to China for relief on mm-hmm. some of these debts and, and for, for assistance, literally. Um, you know, the, the, the Chinese weren't going to make them whole. And so that's a warning sign um, for, about some of these debt traps that have been created by Chinese uh, finance infrastructure projects. And, and it geopolitically, I think what you might see is India trying to move into the space because India and China have kind of competed for Mm -hmm. influence in Sri Lanka. I don't usually like to see countries as part of some geopolitical struggle. But in this case, I think it is the case that China and India have competed for influence there. And so one interesting thing to watch going forward is whatever government emerges, are they turning to China? Are they turning to India? Are they turning to like the IMF and the World Bank um, to see where they go? The other thing is, this is an early indicator of political instability to come because of inflation and Big the time. war in Ukraine. And we've been talking about this, but this is kind of the first domino to drop maybe of a country where the inflationary pressure combined with post-pandemic pressures combined with, you know, uh, maybe food shortages um, becomes really combustible. And I, I think we are going to see um, more scenes, frankly, like Dudes jumping into swimming pools at the presidential palace in Sri Lanka, instability in other countries as we get six months out, a year out, um, with this continued inflation, with the continued food shortages, this should be a warning sign to other countries that have vulnerabilities like this. Yeah. I mean, and I think the Rajapaksa family got blamed because they are to blame in, in a lot of ways, but also because they've been around since. I mean, they've, the family's been in politics since the 50s, but they've been in control for a couple decades. They built all these stupid projects. They named them after themselves. Everyone yeah. knew it. So people were like, absolutely not. You know, they blamed the sort of post-pandemic drop in tourism or there were some terrorist, I think, uh, threats or attacks in Sri Lanka that really hurt tourism and just crippled the economy. But yeah, I mean, even these protesters who are so justifiably angry at the, the corruption and mismanagement, uh, the New York Times reported that they helped to pick up trash in the mansion after people yeah. had stormed it. Yeah. They were watering the plants. Yeah. People found like 50 grand in cash that they picked up, counted, and turned into police. So this is the most polite yeah. uh, overthrow of a yeah. presidential yeah. office in contrast to January 6th, by the way, I, uh, I, I've yeah. ever seen. <laughs> yeah. I will say that um, it should be noted that Sri Lanka has a really vibrant civil society, a good uh, activist community, and, and that speaks to the quality of the opposition there. Just to put a note on other potential places of unrest, we've talked about the Middle East and North Africa and the Horn of Africa, Central Asia. Um, you know, uh, we saw some pretty intense protests in a part of Uzbekistan recently. Yeah, those are scary. Um, and so I just keep an eye on this, like the, 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 this kind of thing happening in more places. Yeah, for sure. On Tuesday, President Biden's heading to the Middle East. He's going to go to Israel, the West Bank and Saudi Arabia. 
Um, the the goals for the trip were outlined by the president in a Washington Post op-ed over the weekend. The gist is Biden wants to push countries to have closer relations with Israel under the Abraham Accords for more coordination generally against Iran, hopefully some progress on ending the Saudi-led war in Yemen, and then to get the Saudis and the UAE to pump more oil. The timing here is tough. Uh, the Israeli government just collapsed. Yair Lapid is serving as a caretaker prime minister until the elections in November. Bibi Netanyahu is waiting in the wings, and for some reason, Biden is meeting with him. I um, hope not. God, I hope that's not true. I just <laughs> yeah, I keep yeah. seeing it, though. But interestingly, yeah. so Biden's visiting a hospital in East Jerusalem, which apparently is the first time a U.S. president has gotten into that part of the city. Um, he'll meet with President Mahmoud Abbas as well from the Palestinian Authority. Things get obviously more complicated when Biden goes to Saudi Arabia. He will meet with Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, who ordered the execution of journalist Jamal Khashoggi back in 2018, among his long human yeah. rights violation rap sheet. So, man, let's just do this in parts. First, the Israel West Bank trip. Do, do you think that this leg just got scheduled because Biden wanted to go to Saudi to, to make this ask on oil? And, and advisors said, look what happened to Obama when he went to Egypt without going to Saudi Arabia first. Like, you just get killed politically. Because I feel like this visit went from fine, like kind of harmless to do, to a bit politically a, dicey with yeah. the government collapse. Um, and then again, like, I, I know you meet with opposition leaders. I know you meet with people out of power all the time. But why BB Netanyahu? Yeah, why? I, I like, ugh, I'm, I'm going to have a hard time. He's meeting with Neftali Bennett? Yeah, I mean... <laughs> You can just meet with Lapid uh, and and Bennett because Bennett was the guy who was in on the deal. I just don't think it's at all necessary to meet with Bibi Netanyahu and Bibi Netanyahu spent years undermining Barack Obama, and nobody embraced Donald Trump more. And does anybody think that Bibi Netanyahu doesn't want Donald Trump to be the next president of the United States? He, he was like tweeting like doctored images of Biden falling asleep in meetings. Yeah, like that, a week. Ago. That's who we're talking about. So, I totally unnecessary. Uh, that's the first point. There are a couple of things bothering me about this. Like when you combine the the, the two elements, because I think you're right. I think they realize they're going to Saudi Arabia. They, they decide to swallow that pill. And so it's like, well, we, we can't go there without going to Israel because we could get criticized politically. And if we go to Israel, we can kind of spotlight the Abraham Accords. Mm -hmm. You and I have talked about this. Um, you had a great piece in The Atlantic today about yeah, this. Yeah. And I'll get into that on the Saudi piece. I guess what I'd say, though, is that it lends a flavor to the visit that I don't know they intended, which is that the JCPOA talks, the Iran deal talks, are kind of dead in the water, right? And a premise of the Abraham Accords yep. is this kind of block that is being formed to confront Iran. And it feels like by by having this really high-profile multi-day visit to Israel and Saudi Arabia, like— they're kind of signing up for a much more hawkish confrontational Iran policy. Um, and, and I just, where is that leading? You know, like I, 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 I'm all for like, you know, standing up to uh, Iranian behavior that uh, endangers interests in the region. But like, it, it, I don't know if they're backing into this or going into it head first, you know. Um, Are you referencing the – there's a quote from Jake Sullivan about intelligence suggesting that Iran was transferring drones basically to the Russians? Yeah. So, there, well, that – that so I wasn't thinking about that directly. <clears throat> but, yeah, so Jake Sullivan came out and, and said that the, the Iranians are going to start providing these drones to Russia. And then Putin came out and announced that he was going to visit Iran, right? And so – Part of what worries me, and this has kind of worried me in the back of my head since the beginning of the Ukraine war, sometimes when you have a big war like that, like it can pop up in other places, you know, and, and if the, the Iran kind of Gulf-Israel confrontation becomes like tethered in a weird way to the Ukraine war and, and there's this heightened risk of a military conflict with Iran over its nuclear program, like I just... I think de-escalation should be <laughs> what we're going for here. Uh, we'll get to the Gulf piece in a minute. B but then also on the Israel piece, like, I'm glad that, that Biden is is going to East Jerusalem. But, like, man, there's really nothing to show about what our theory of the case even is about the future for the Palestinian people. Because, as you talked about, they're totally left out of these <coughs> Abraham Accords, which they're going to wrap their arms around on this trip. And there's not like a peace process and there's not really an answer to the question, you know, announcing assistance to the Palestinians is, is all well and good. But like to lead where politically, you know, never mind the fact that the State Department sort of announced a, what seemed like a whitewashed report on the, the killing of Shuri Nabok. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We didn't talk about that. I mean, basically took the Israeli side that like, well, this seemed to come from where the IDF was, the Israeli Defense Forces. But we we can't say that 
why that happened and they were conducting these you know operations and it, it did feel like the best possible you know uh presentation let's mm -hmm. just say of of those findings for for israel yeah so let's turn to the saudi piece of this so i think listeners of the show know that we both would prefer joe biden not go to saudi arabia for this trip uh, you you really do get the feeling that Biden himself hates that he has to make this trip. Yeah. Um, he keeps emphasizing the regional diplomacy piece. Everyone else seems to think that the trip is about asking the Saudis to increase oil production. That rationale is kind of undercut by the fact that then you'll read, you know, experts in Bloomberg or whatever talking about the fact that the Saudis and the UAE can only increase production by by at most three million barrels a day, which basically offsets what's getting taken off the market from Russia, from sanctions. But I mean, that might even be a generous estimate of what excess capacity they have. And that's like the best case scenario. Best case yeah. scenario. And then U.S. refineries are, are operating at, at 95%. I mean, that's how your oil gets to gasoline. So there's yeah. not a lot of slack there. So Ben, I guess I'm just sort of like at a bit of a loss for what the best case deliverable could be out of this trip. The, the one thing I could come up with that would really make it worth it if, if the Saudis said, we commit to fully and immediately end the war in Yemen, full stop. Yes. So on the so I do think the best outcome of this trip, if they can kind of take a ceasefire that has been kind of tenuous in Yemen and really pull that forward and move towards a political resolution in Yemen, that would be good. And, and I think that would be like a, a positive outcome. Um, I, as you mentioned, I have a piece in The Atlantic that I, I hope you guys check out because um, I like I, I you know, really tried to to unpack my my grievances with this trip. And so I'll try to do that quickly here. The first is that you kind of see this kind of lazy talking point that, well, it's a triumph of interest over values, right? And I kind of question, like, are Saudi Arabia's interests really aligned with ours? Like the Iran deal, which, you know, Biden said he wanted to return to, like they supported Trump in getting out of that and, and bringing us to this brink that we're on uh, with Iran. The war in Yemen that has been ongoing and that Biden committed to, to ending U.S. support for, that continues. And the U.S. has not tried, while the diplomacy has been good, they, we've not tried doing what the Democratic Party uniformly voted for um, in the Trump years, which is halting all support for Saudi-led military operations in Yemen. And, and by the way, also pausing arms sales to Saudi Arabia. Um, you've seen Saudi Arabia meddling against stated U.S. interests in the region by getting in, interfering in Lebanese politics, and Lebanon's kind of gone off the rails. Since, Truly, the craziest story. Yeah, maybe in years. Yeah, since they took they, they, you know they took the, <laughs> the prime minister, the prime minister hostage in Riyadh. Remember that one? Go down memory lane bizarre, on that. Bizarre. Backing a warlord in Libya against the U.S.-backed government in Tripoli, right? Uh, the blockade of Qatar. Like this is not like are those our interests? Like you know, Saudi foreign policy. I would argue, like how has it been aligned with our interests? Um, so th that's the one point. Then the the, the other point is that. I think that they're worried about, you know, the Saudis and Emiratis kind of drifting into the Russian Chinese camp, you know, in, in mm -hmm. the context of Ukraine and a lot of things. And that's always a concern uh, of, of national security types. I, I would say, like, first of all, the, the Saudi and Emirati military dependency on the U.S. is not something that can be untangled in a few years with Russia. And oh, by the way, it's not like Russia looks like a great bet. No. Uh, for your military supplier no, these days, you know, yeah. if they're asking Iran for drones. And, and there's these rumors that there are going to be these defense pacts with uh, the Gulf states, um, like kind of de facto alliances. And, and this is the bigger point. Like, are these really in a battle of democracies versus autocracies? They are autocracies, right? And we talk a lot on the show that the existential challenges to the United States, to us and our children and grandchildren are the survivability of democracy and climate change. And a reset with a oil rich dictator is not how you deal with those challenges. And at some point, like we have to own that. It makes our rhetoric about democracy look like complete hypocrisy and completely self-interested. It makes our rhetoric about climate change look less important than trying to get like a dictator to pump some more oil. And so, look, I get it. It's hard. And I said in this piece, like, I don't put this all in Joe Biden in part because it seems like he doesn't really want to go, but also think like Obama engaged the Saudis like, oh, yeah. uh, we, you know, I, I, I just think at some point we need to change this this prison that we put ourselves in, that, that we are somehow dependent on these on these dictatorships in the Gulf. Like it, it gives them all the power. It takes away all of our leverage and gives it to them. Yeah, and I, we're just facilitating the laundering of their reputation post Khashoggi. You know, yes. this is worth a million. Like 
how can you ask Newcastle, you know, how can you ask governments to not deal with like the Saudis and things like buying um, a, a soccer team or financing a golf league if the president of the United States is over there shaking hands with them? Yeah, I mean, I think like, look, if we're being honest, historically, the U.S. position on human rights is wildly inconsistent yes. over multiple presidents. Multiple administrations, and decades, and, including the one you and I served in. Yes, yeah, and something I we should work on. Own it completely. Um, I do wonder if Biden would be in Saudi Arabia right now, if not for the war in Ukraine. And I imagine that will be a huge topic of conversation. Um, so let's just talk about the latest. So some key updates. In recent weeks, Russia has taken full control of the Luhansk province in eastern Ukraine, and they're escalating airstrikes on the Donetsk province. Over the weekend, the Russians uh, leveled a five-story residential building that killed dozens of civilians in Donetsk. So the, the war crimes continue. There is some anecdotal evidence suggesting that the new long-range U.S. missile systems are getting used effectively by the Ukrainian military to hit targets like Russian ammo depots. Uh, there's rumblings that this might be the beginning of a, a bigger Ukrainian counteroffensive in southern Ukraine. But none of those systems is going to be you know, a quick fix. It's going to be a long war of attrition, literally. And then the Nord Stream 1 pipeline, which brings natural gas from Russia to Germany, went offline for 10 days of scheduled maintenance starting on Monday. As we've discussed previously, Germany is super dependent, heavily dependent on Russian natural gas. I think 30% of their natural gas is from Russia, as are several other European countries. And Gazprom, the Russian you know, energy conglomerate run by the state, has drastically reduced the flow of gas through Nord Stream over the last few months. And German officials are worried that Russia might use this maintenance period to just cut it off completely. That has left German businesses scrambling to figure out how they would keep operating. The German authorities had planned to use this period in the summer to fill up their storage units of natural gas. That might not be able to happen. The German parliament is like reaching out to like telling individuals they're going to need to cut their personal consumption over the winter. The parliament, um, they've decided to lower the temperature in their offices by two degrees come winter. Like that's how the specific we're talking about here. So Ben, I mean, look, first of all, not a lot of great updates there in terms generally, but you know, talking about the long tail of, of some of the things we're going to see in terms of gas prices going up, instability, food prices going up. I mean, no one is spared. This is Germany. Yeah. We're talking about like, yeah, the engine of, the of the European economy. Countries in the world. Yeah. You've, got, you've got like industrial bases saying like, we don't know how we are going to continue doing whatever it is we do, manufacture, et cetera, if we don't have energy. It's very ominous. It is. I mean, and it, it speaks to this like a war of attrition that Putin is going to want to wage where he's weaponizing everything from the price of fuel and gas in Europe to like literally tens of millions of people having enough food around the world. And like there's just going to have to be a really aggressive effort to find as many workarounds as possible. To, to, uh, and, 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 and again, I think in that regard, it's not just like Saudis pumping oil. It's like, are there other energy solutions that can be brought into this picture? You know, um, are there efficiencies that can be uh, developed in the energy space, but also like politically, like, you know, unfortunately, <laughs> you're not going to be able to mitigate it all. And politicians need to make the case for why their people are going to have to make some sacrifice because of the war in Ukraine. I, that's hard, but like, you can't avoid it, you know. And I think that you saw this in the European population in particular, this kind of stirring of solidarity with Ukraine at the beginning, that's going to have to be, you know, continually maintained. But also, I think it, it raises questions about, like, what is the end game in Ukraine? And, and, and can, can political leaders um, provide some sense of where this is going and what the outcome is that we're looking for? It may get to a point where just saying, you know, we need to make sure Russia loses, which is kind of the, the standard talking point. Well, is there what is the negotiation that you want to pursue? Um, uh, because, you know, because this is going to become politically more and more difficult. Yeah, it's going to be really hard. I mean, speaking of politically difficult and, and more news out of Russia. So last week, um, WNBA star Brittany Griner pleaded guilty in a Russian court to charges of possession of hash oil. Griner said she packed quickly and accidentally basically brought vape cartridges in her luggage. She was flying to Russia. She flew to Russia to play in a league there that, by the way, pays a hell of a lot better than the WNBA. So she's played there for years and has been detained by Russian authorities since February, right before the invasion started. Uh, Griner appears back in court on July 14th. Then I think the question is whether Brittany Griner pleaded guilty in an effort to conclude the trial quickly, 
and then get to a stage where the U.S. and Russia can maybe cut a deal to get her home, or maybe it allows her team to ask for clemency and just appeal that way. I don't know. I hope one of those things is true. Uh, Biden and Vice President Harris called Brittany Griner's wife last week, and then at the hearing, an embassy official was able to hand Brittany Griner a letter from President Biden himself. Biden's also under a lot of pressure now to get a former Marine named Paul Whelan out of Russia. Whelan has been held in Russia since 2018. So again, super hard situation here. Um, and one where, you know, look, there's going to be a lot of pressure, understandably, I think reasonably, on President Biden to do as much as he possibly can. But the reality is that Putin and the Russians have all the leverage here because they are holding her. And if this is a hostage. Yeah, on this, I'm, I'm like entirely sympathetic to the Biden administration. They, they don't they can't control this. They can't make um, Russia uh, return Brittany Griner. And I think what you've seen is different phases, like the first phase, they tried to be quiet about it. And I think that's always the right approach, even if people would like to see more noise, because, you know, you want to see if you can kind of deal with this through the justice system. Um, now, it's clear that the justice system was completely rigged against Brittany Griner because she should not be facing the charges she's facing for the amount of yeah. stuff that she had on her. And, and, and so therefore, yeah, I think you're right. I think her plea it feels like, OK, we're not going to get a fair shot. So let's kind of ex- expedite the, the judicial process so that we can kind of get to some other outcome, whether it's clemency or whether it's a, a swap. And we talked about Victor Victor Booth, this notorious arms dealer. Horrible. That, uh, the Russians won. Evil in arms turn. dealer. So I'm sure they're probably trying to find, is there anybody else that we can trade here? Um, one question, you know, is, is there anyone else that we can trade here? Um, you know, are, are there other countries that might be able to be helpful and brokering something between the U.S. and Russia at a time that we don't have good relationships. You just try everything you can. I, I do want to, like, you and I have talked about this, Tommy. Like, I actually want to, to take on one kind of critique out there that I've seen that I understand where it's coming from, but I'm not sure that it's accurate, which is, uh, as someone who admires Brittany Griner and understands the frustration of people who are like, why isn't there more attention on this? Um, I totally agree that they're can and should have been just kind of more public awareness and attention on this because of how uh, important a figure she is. But this idea that if like LeBron James was in a Russian prison, he'd be home by now. Like, actually, I, I, I actually think LeBron James would 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 be in Russian prison for a higher price. Right. Like you, yeah. have, to, you have to you have to get into Putin's shoes here. I, I'm trying. He's going to try to leverage any American he can detain of prominence for as much as he can get in return here. So I don't I don't think Putin would have like caved, you know, it, by, because of the prominence of somebody. I think what Putin's trying to do is leverage anybody and anything he can. Yeah, know? I think the fair criticism is that LeBron James never would have been in Russia because he doesn't have to travel abroad. That's totally to fair. Paid a fair wage, yes. right? 100% And reasonable. that if LeBron James had been detained in Russia, it would have been the number one story in the news in the world for every day that he was detained there. Also know? true. That doesn't mean that Putin wouldn't be a fucking monster. Yeah, about I mean, it. And, let's and, remember, we're de- I only say that not to, it's not an attack on those critics. It's it's to keep people focused on like, Putin is the guy. Yeah. It's not Joe Biden. It's, like, Putin is the guy at fault here, you know? This guy is indiscriminately killing kids. Yeah. You know, that's what we're dealing with. That's what we have to remember. Here's another story of a, an amazing athlete, Ben, uh, out of the UK. So Sir Mo Farah is a British long distance runner and gold medalist who's one of the greatest track runners ever. Do you remember him in the, I remember him in those 2012 Olympics? Not at Olympics. all. Oh, okay. I don't remember, but you flagged this one like you were like super yeah, into this guy. because he just fucking crushed those Olympics. Yeah. So yeah, he's like a he multi-gold like medal winner. He was winner. the hero of those Olympics okay, right, for the okay. Brits. Yeah. So new BBC documentary where Farah talks about how he was actually trafficked to the UK as a child and forced to work as a domestic servant. Far had previously said he came to the UK from uh, Somalia or maybe Somali land with his parents as a refugee. But in this new doc, he says that at age eight or nine, he had to leave his parents. He went to live in Djibouti and they got flown to the UK by a woman he'd never met before who told him to say his name was Muhammad. That was not his name. And then forced him to work as basically her domestic servant. That situation persisted for a while until he started running track. His PE instructor obviously took you know, acute interest in him because he's one of the best athletes on the planet. And then that PE teacher helped uh, Farah get placed with a different foster family and he sort of blossomed and became the star that we know today. So, But this documentary is called The Real Mo Farah and comes out on BBC One on Wednesday, July 13th. But it looks like an incredible story. Yeah. I, you know, first of all, like I, I give him a lot of respect for 
for telling the story, right? And and there's some legal risk, right? He can't, you know, he he his papers weren't. He could order. lose his citizenship. He could, he could lose his citizenship. He's been assured that he won't. I but. think people, yeah, he won't. Uh, he's a sir after all, right? For sure, um, yeah. <laughs> but like I, you know, there's we're heavy on recommendations today. There's a movie called Flea. Did you see this movie? Mm-mm. Flea was nominated for best uh, both animated film and documentary, but it's basically a story of a, a refugee. And it, 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 this story triggered my memory of that, that movie, which everybody should check out. This is a common thing where traffickers, um, m- now, Mo Farah's story is a little different than Flea, but I'll get to that. The traffickers in that movie tell the, the kid, when you get to Europe, flush your passport down the toilet, tell them this is your name, tell them all your family's dead, because that's how you will get to stay there. You know, So in other words... Uh, some of these refugee children who are trafficked, like, are basically told, you can't tell them that you have a family because mm-hmm. then they'll send you back, right. you know? And, and and the pain that people suffer because they essentially have to lose their identity to get to safe haven, that's, that's a common problem. Now, what he's highlighting is next level problem, which is basically modern day slavery. Yeah. Because he was sent up to the UK and what this woman did is as soon as... She got him into the UK. She literally tore up his papers in front of him and were like, if you want to be safe, if you want to be fed, if you want to survive, you have to be a servant, you know. And he, at the age of nine, was taking care of other people's kids and doing the dishes and basically was a domestic servant, you know. And and here's this guy who is world famous and, you know, hugely famous in the UK who, who was a a slave, essentially, yeah. you know, and, 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 and a victim of human trafficking. And so I think he's spotlighting, I mentioned Flea because he's spotlighting the whole spectrum of what happens to people in this world. The worst end of the spectrum is people who are literally enslaved, but even people that uh, go through perilous refugee journeys, they can lose their identities, they lose their papers, they, they're so vulnerable that, that they, they lose who they are and they have to spend the rest of their life recovering that. And, and hopefully this helps other people become aware of that that issue and, and and deal with it. This is a particularly acute, awful problem in the Gulf, yeah. uh, in the Persian Gulf. There's a lot of individuals that get trafficked from name your country or told that they're going to work in Qatar or you know a country in the region, and basically their employment is controlled by you know, the family they're working for, and they will not let them leave. Yeah, take away their papers. They have papers. no freedom to travel. They take their passports. It's it's horrifying. And the worst, uh, I sh- we shouldn't leave out the sex trafficking thing, yeah. where sometimes girls literally find themselves in, in brothels in these situations. So this, hopefully this can spark like a just greater global awareness and action on this issue. Yeah. Um, ben, my favorite story of the week is also a sports story. So four men in India were arrested for staging a fake cricket tournament and accepting bets on it via the Telegram app from people watching in Russia. This wasn't just like, uh, this wasn't just any fake cricket match. It was was a fake Indian Premier League match, which I I think is the biggest, baddest, most famous league. And I know nothing about cricket, but this is what I read. These guys staged more than nine games, cricket matches, and they live streamed them with fake crowd noise, running commentary, actual players like pitching, swinging the bat, umpires sort of like coordinating the whole thing based on the bets so that they win. And they got a bunch of people in Russian cities to place bets. And I think they just bilked these Russians yeah. who were gambling on them. And so, I mean, I just say these guys should not be arrested. I think they should be um, maybe given a daytime Emmy. Or a Hulu documentary. Or a documentary, you know? yep. Uh, like, yeah, they, I mean, just sometimes the grift is actually like admirable. Did you see The Sting? No. Redford Newman? Uh, a long time ago. It's the same yeah. idea. Like so, they fake set up match? they set up a whole fake uh, horse racing thing, complete with announcers and everything. They bring these big this big gambler in to place a bet on a race that like doesn't exist. That's you know? genius. Yeah, it's genius. So these guys, I mean, had, but don't you think it's like Hulu Doc? Like, yeah. Uh, um, I'm sure someone's already optioned this IP. Uh, probably Modi. Yeah. Um, <laughs> another sports story, Ben. So former National Security Advisor and Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice is joining the new Denver Broncos ownership group. Rice is a well-known to be a big football fan, NFL fan. She moved to Denver when she was 12 years old. She attended the University of Denver for undergrad and graduate school. So she has real ties to Denver. Uh, The Broncos were recently purchased by an ownership group led by Walmart heir Rob Walton and his family. 
Time will tell. Uh, ben F. Condi and the new ownership group are greeted as liberators by the Broncos fan base. Former Denver Broncos GM John Elway was asked what value a former Bush administration official could bring to the franchise. And he said, quote, in football, there are known knowns and known unknowns. But when you play at mile high, you can't let the smoking gun be a mushroom cloud. So that's obviously a fake quote, and frankly, doesn't even make oh, sense. I'm glad but... you said that, because I was going to try to work in a smoking gun and become mushroom cloud, and you did it for me. Do you remember, though, jokes aside. She's, back... like, talk about someone who's just escaped accountability. All accountability. You know? Well, in 2018, Adam Schechter from ESPN, yeah. like one of the top yeah, no, two or three yeah. sports reporters, guy who breaks all the news, he reported that the Cleveland Browns wanted to interview Condi Rice for the head coaching job. Yeah, I don't get this. Like, So basically, Condi Rice... I will say, like, football's always been, like, a weird part of her reputation laundering mm-hmm. because, you know, this is someone who is literally the national security advisor, the top official in the run of the Iraq war, said the smoking gun could be a mushroom cloud, oversaw all the manipulation of intelligence, and, and then oversaw the catastrophic failure to, to plan for the war and everything, you know? Mm-hmm. And yet, like, the charming card she always played was that she was, like, a football fan, and it's like, okay, so is, like, half of America. Like, I... I like Some, she's gotten a lot of mileage out of being a football fan. Someone yeah. got an ESPN reporter to report that the Cleveland Browns were going to interview for a head why, coach. Why? Why would? I, I'm, well, because she did such a good job, bang up job with like that whole Iraq uh, occupation thing that she's going to run the Browns defense. Yeah, you know? I just like I certainly the NFL could uh, could you know diversify the ranks here, but like the pretending that they're going to interview someone who's never coached a football team is like an incredibly condescending way to pretend <laughs> to do it. It's just yeah. obviously a lie to just launder some reputation. Because she thing. says she's like a fan a lot. I mean, like, like this is what I don't get about like everybody's a football fan, or most yeah. people are. Best of luck with the Broncos. I never uh, like yeah. This this, this gives got Russell me, Wilson. This just gives me a reason to to to, to not root for the Broncos. Sorry, yeah, I'm with you. sorry. I know I've got a lot of friends in Colorado, and I respect how. Intensely, they root for the Broncos, but I don't. Uh, it's hard for me to get into this. I don't yeah. give a shit yeah. about the Broncos. <laughs> no, no. no offense. Well, you're a Patriots guy. Uh, Mac Jones MVP this year. Uh, yeah. I think so. Oh, how about, how about your little Jets scandal? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's you know my team's uh, it, when you're a Knicks and Jets fan and Mets fan, it, you know you you know, kind of doesn't go well. Uh, if you, uh, listener, if you don't know, we're talking about Google Jets quarterback mom friend. Um, yes. Finally, Ben, uh, I want to play our audience some words of wisdom from former National Security Advisor John Bolton. Take a listen. It's not an attack on our democracy. It's Donald Trump looking out for Donald Trump. It's a once-in-a-lifetime occurrence. I don't know that I agree with you to be, to be uh, fair, with all due respect. Uh, one doesn't have to be brilliant to attempt a coup. Uh, I disagree with that. As somebody who has helped plan coup d'etat, yeah. not here, but, you know, other places, uh, it takes a lot of work. And that's not what he did. I mean, <laughs> like, that, it takes a lot of work, Tommy. Uh, his, his point is basically as, you do have to be brilliant to plan a coup. I, I, first of all, no, actually. like Because no, the coups he's no. planned, I mean, we talked about some of the coups that he planned on this show. Like when he when he stood up in the Roosevelt room and taped a video saying that like Venezuela was about to collapse mm-hmm. and there was a plane taking Maduro out. I mean, I think there was a plural in his I do comment. Too. Like I think he was not referring to one coup. What I think uh, he's referring to like many coups. Was he talking about his time in the eighties? And, and y- y- who a knows rock? how many places? I mean, I don't know. What like, coup is know, just add him up, right? Um, and like at the end of the day, this fucking guy is is your classic case of someone that went to work for Trump because he wanted to do his coups Mm -hmm. and thought like Trump was like either a big enough lunatic or checked out enough that he could kind of just work under the radar and do his own coups and his own shit. And then had this opportunity to take a shot at Trump during the first impeachment. And he famously refused to show up to testify because he was too busy trying to get his book out and, and get better paid speaking uh, on the circuit than he would get from the Senate that was conducting the hearing on impeachment. And now this fucking guy wants to put himself forward as some kind of defender of American democracy. Well, guess what? Like part of the thing that led to the coup here is that the kinds of people like him that were doing coups in other countries, right? Like, like how we act with impunity around the world is part of what happened here, right? I mean, 
like he tests out the coups in enough places and some people say, well, why don't we just try out the coup here? So that was Jake Tapper doing the interview. Uh, I was reading some more about Jake this. Jake can usually, by the way, be quicker in response, but I think even he was probably- Jake take- was just shocked, yeah, yeah, I think. Yeah. yeah. But I guess Tapper later uh, asked Bolton for more specifics on which <laughs> countries he has plotted coups. <laughs> yeah. And Mr. Bolton, uh, this according to Yahoo News, uh, alluded to material he wrote about in a book uh, on U.S. Yeah. activities in Venezuela in 2018 and 2019. He's trying to get people to buy his book again. That's like- Probably pretty classified, sir, if you were planning coups in Venezuela in 2018, 2019. What, what about the dudes who are still in prison because yes. they tried to do a coup in Venezuela? Remember those guys, those special forces guys who were at Mar-a-Lago and then headed down there? I mean, like, could somebody maybe look into this? I mean, uh, and I actually found a video, Tommy, um, and I tweeted this, of him saying literally on camera about Venezuela in 2018, 2019, it's not like this is a coup. This is not a coup. Oh, my God. <laughs> so uh, I, I guess John Bolton you know, can lie with impunity like all these fuckers. I mean— Sorry about my F-bombs. No, John listen. John Bolton brings it out of me. He is the worst. I mean, talk about someone who is just has no apologies for his no, role in the war No in self-reflection. We sit here, you know, and we talked about Saturday Arabia before. Like, we, like I, I'm more than willing to—and as you are all the time, like, wrestling with, like— Things that the administration we work for may have not. These guys never own up to anything, you know. Connie Rice with like a her, you know Cleveland Browns coach over there, and like John Bolton with his coups on television. I mean, I know that Trump is like the first order threat, um, but man, these guys are not far behind. I beg to differ. It takes a lot of planning to do. Well, a what's so amazing what? is what got him to do that wasn't Jake like cornering him. It was like he felt insulted. Yes. As 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 a as a coup planner. You know, like the thing that offends him, I guess, about January 6th is that it wasn't a good enough coup. It was a poorly like, He could have planned a better coup. coup, you know? I mean, Jesus Christ. Okay, well. Uh, and by but, the way, how do you like to be in one of those other countries? Like, you know, this just, like, what a message that sends to the world. You and I had a lot of conversations with the Summit of the Americas and their refusal to invite Venezuela or Cuba and all these other countries. And, like, this comment from John Bolton will just be played ad nauseum in those places. Why wouldn't they think that? They should, yeah. They should be cynical. <laughs> John Bolton And by the way, yeah. it doesn't help. Like, just, so for some of the people that might add us, how does that help the Venezuelan opposition? How does it help Juan Guaido you know, or Leopoldo Lopez to have a goon like John Bolton be like, yeah, we, you know, I plan to coup down there. It makes them look like U.S. lackeys. Yeah, you know? they're pawns. Great job, John. Good, Good to job. see you out yeah. on TV again. Uh, okay, we're going to take a quick break, and then we'll have Ben's interview with Asia expert Danny Russell about uh, Shinzo Abe, his legacy, Japanese politics, all sorts of good stuff. So stick around for that. I'm very pleased to welcome back to Pod Save the World uh, a very good friend of ours, Danny Russell, the former Assistant Secretary of State for Asia, longtime diplomat, including uh, how many years were you in Japan, Danny? A bunch, right? Uh, yeah, I guess as a diplomat, probably seven or eight. Yeah. So Danny Russell, um, Welcome back to the pod, and uh, and thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Ben. It's great to be here. So we want to talk about um, the assassination of uh, Shinzo Abe. Um, and before we get into Abe and his legacy, which is the bulk of the conversation, I just wanted to ask you to explain to our listeners like how shocking an event it is in Japan for there to be this kind of political violence and this kind of gun violence in particular uh, in the country? Well, I think arithmetic is the clearest answer. Um, you know, since the end of World War II, there have been maybe five, maybe six, depending on the account of uh, acts of uh, p- real political violence against major political figures, not all of which ended in fatalities. and. I think that on an average year, there will be somewhere between uh, four and 10 gun deaths in all of Japan, a country of 120 plus million people, of which uh, half or two thirds are gangsters shooting at each other and avoiding citizens. So just from the arithmetic alone, you can see that this is you know, the blackest of black swan events. It's it's virtually unthinkable, and it really causes Japanese people to ask themselves, you know, who, what have we become? How is this possible? Uh, who are we anyway? Yeah, and, and again, one more question before we get to Abe. You know, 
on the who are we, it, it doesn't feel like this is a sign of, you know, guns being a rising problem because it seems like this guy kind of made his own gun. Um, so it's not like there's a wash in AR-15s over there. But there is this question of his motives are kind of strange. You know, it seems kind of kind of wacky and conspiracy theory minded. Um, is that a sign that some of the same kind of uh, maybe social media driven or, or conspiracy theory driven type of radicalization that has plagued other countries is, is you know, taking root in some form in Japan? Have you talked to anybody there about that? Yeah, I really don't think so. And I don't think that there are many analysts in Japan who uh, see that uh, kind of infection leaching into Japan from the world. There have been, you know, quite apart from the rare instances of political violence, there have been horrible crimes in uh, Japan, such as the uh, the sarin gas attack in the subway. Um, which also had some ups, some pretty fuzzy religious or pseudo-religious roots. Um, there are the occasional stabbings uh, in a kindergarten. I mean, horrific crimes that I think uh, most Japanese, at least, believe reflect kind of the lunatic fringe of humanity, that kind of these things happen. And I suspect that uh, by and large, Japanese people see the assassination or the, the murder of uh, Abe not in uh, political terms vis-a-vis -vis the motive, but more as one of these um, rare but uh, occasional outbursts. It's like a tsunami or a volcano eruption. It's yeah. destructive, but it doesn't necessarily mean anything. Now, it's a very unclear picture what the real backstory and motives of the attacker really are, and we may never know it. It's certainly the case that uh, if he could have gotten a hold of a gun, he would have. Yeah, yeah. He went to an awful lot of trouble uh, to create devices uh, to, to kill. And I think it's pretty horrific that um, he was able to succeed. I, I think the biggest uh, impact is going to be on the Japanese special police who uh, you know, clearly have a lot to learn about um, close protection. Yeah, no, you could see that in the video that, that there was basically very little protection. Okay, so getting into Abe, um, before we even get to like the extent of his legacy, which is enormous, why don't you just explain to listeners who might not follow Japanese politics that closely who Shinzo Abe was and why he was such a big figure in Japanese political life? Well, I don't know whether to begin in like the Muromachi era of 1100 <laughs> or the Edo period, but let's uh, suffice it to say that Abe Shinzo comes from an awfully long line. Uh, he's a blue blood politician. Uh, his grandfather was a very uh, prominent uh, post-war, pre-war, during the war, post-war uh, politician and prime minister. Uh, his father... Uh, was foreign minister and was on track to become a prime minister, but uh, died early of natural causes. He was very much to the manner born. And right now, I don't know the exact stats, but the preponderance of the elected legislators in the Japanese diet, the diet members, are uh, children, which is to say sons, if not grandsons of other politicians. So this, this is a guild system in Japan. And Abe was at the sort of highest echelon of, of the guild. So it was a given that he would become a politician. He inherited his father's seat. What was not a given was that he would prove to be a successful and effective uh, politician within Japan because in Japan, politics is a team sport. It's not about an individual with an idea, raising money, you know, championing a, an issue set, winning primaries or anything like that. It's about these factions, uh, which bear an uncanny resemblance to mafia families. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. they're, they, they raise money uh, within the system. They, they back the leader. The leaders make deals. They divide up territory, that kind of stuff. Uh, and there was no reason to think that Abe, who was perceived as a kind of 
hothouse flower, a bit of a spoiled brat, had the wherewithal or the brass to really come out uh, on top in that sort of rugby game of Japanese politics. And there were a number of flukes that broke his way. Uh, he really kind of made his name on the North Korea related issue of abduction. The Japanese citizens who were in the 70s and 80s um, kidnapped by North Korean agents from the shores of uh, the Sea of Japan on the West Coast brought to uh, North Korea and used for spy training and for other purposes. Um, he, he grabbed that issue, uh, helped capture the public imagination, uh, went with then Prime Minister Koizumi to North Korea and uh, used that as a springboard for uh, ministry positions and ultimately for uh, control of his own faction. Let's break this into to two pieces, I guess, the kind of domestic and the foreign. Um, we talked a little bit about this earlier. You know, he's the longest serving uh, Japanese prime minister, two stints, um, one around 2006, but then most prominently 2012 to 2020 when we overlapped with him a bit. Um, domestically, you know, you talk about abenomics, you talk about, you know, uh, a guy with like a, a very clear um, economic program. Um, what, what is his legacy within Japan uh, on the Japanese economy and, and, and in terms of his domestic policy, you know, really coming out of a, what, what had been a pretty rough period for Japan uh, economically for a couple of decades there? Well, there's almost no comparison really uh, between uh, the Shinzo Abe that had a, a brief and ignominious one year term in 2006-07 and the guy who came back into office and who served in office from uh, 2012 to 2020. Um, the, the, the second Abe um, was a, a leader. Uh, he came in with a well-articulated program uh, with a tremendous amount of political support. He won in a landslide, and that, again, had everything to do with the fecklessness of the, the three opposition prime ministers, Hatoyama, followed by uh, Khan, followed by Noda, uh, and much less to do with the traditional ruling party, the LDP, that um, he's uh, a product of and a member of. But nevertheless, he came in with a huge political mandate, a tremendous amount of capital, and with a, a brand. His brand was Japan is back. And I don't have to remind you, Ben, of what life was like yeah. dealing with a series of, you know, hobbled one year revolving door Japanese prime ministers. Yeah. Um, we, I think uh, President Obama had what, like five in four years. It was brutal. The best thing to come out of that was the Yes We Con, K-A-N t-shirt that you got <laughs> me once actually around one of those things. Right. Yeah, I hope you still have it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That would go for like 20 bucks on eBay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, I, I think that it's not really Abe's domestic programs that, that kind of made him, um, because after all, um, he really did not get very far on his big uh, ticket agenda items like the so-called three arrows of Abenomics, you know, fiscal policy, monetary policy, okay, and but most importantly, structural reform to Japan's economy. Yeah, that that didn't really happen, and Japan never actually completely pulled out of the you know economic doldrums, etc. But he had a brand, he had an idea. He had a label, you know, he, he had something that people could understand that had an objective. This is the kind of country that we're trying to build. This is what we're trying to accomplish. Same thing on a hugely important issue of women's empowerment. Yeah. You know, um, the, the role and the opportunities for women in Japan, I won't say they're medieval, but they certainly don't fit the sophistication and the modernity of the rest of the economy and the society. Uh, Japan is a country that, you know, apart from water and 
so on, is not exactly blessed with natural resources like oil and gas and gold and so on, but it certainly has tremendous human capital of which approximately 50% is largely going to waste. He got that. What he wasn't able to do was to really deliver much really in unlock the it. Yeah. Yeah. women's empowerment. But he was trying. He was headed in the direction that people um, supported. He did largely thanks to TPP. Yeah, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Trade Agreement, which right. we negotiated and right. then left, and that he completed um, with uh, you know a bunch of other countries. Exactly. Well, look, there's an extraordinary story there. Um, you know, early in the, in the first term, there was great reservations about whether we thought Japan could even join the TPP, even though in theory we wanted it. Uh, in the second term, the president decided very clearly, absolutely we do. And it took a lot of work uh, on the US side uh, to get Abe and the Japanese government to accept the very substantial openings that it was going to have to make, particularly in the agricultural sector. You know, free trade, open markets is, uh, you know, that's, that's not what's tattooed on, you know, the uh, the back of any Japanese politician. Like that doesn't really come naturally to them. But he largely, I think, because of what he saw as the strategic as well as the economic importance of TPP, he made some really tough decisions and he showed a lot of political finesse in busting through some of the... Uh, the barriers that have been in place for a long time, particularly with the agricultural sector. So he took up some uh, big domestic issues, uh, but I think always with a view to the bigger international picture, what he needed to do, what Japan needed to do in order to help ensure that it would be safe in what Abe recognized as a truly dangerous neighborhood. Yeah. So it's a great pivot to like his main legacy, I think, which is uh, trying to reconceive Japan's role in Asia and in the world. And as you said, here's a guy who saw, you know, Japan had been through a period of doldrums, China, you know, rapidly emerging as an economic and geopolitical powerhouse. What What is his legacy in terms of the changes he was trying to make to Japan's defense posture, its foreign policy orientation, and its relationships, particularly in the Asia Pacific, but also around the world? Well, a couple of things. I mean, everybody knows about Obama's famous pivot to Asia, but it's worth recognizing that Abe, in his own way, pivoted Japan uh, to really partner with America. Yeah. And that was uh, not a given after the years of Hatoyama and company who uh, promulgated this isosceles triangle idea of equidistant relations between Tokyo and Washington and Tokyo and Beijing, that maybe the American troops ought to leave, if not Japan as a whole, at least uh, the island of Okinawa. So that pivot was really quite a big deal. Uh, and we saw it in uh, the tough decisions that Abe and the government made in order to make Japan a better ally, a better partner to the United States. Um, the, one of the biggest, which you will remember because they sent uh, people to the White House on a, like short-term apprenticeships, uh, had to do with the creation of the National Security Council in Japan. Yeah. So it completely reconfigured national security decision making in a way that overcame all kinds of bad habits and allowed for uh, real efficiency and real policy focus. He also was able to engineer legislation uh, in Japan that opened the parameters for what the Japanese self-defense force could do, including importantly, what they call collective defense. In other words, if a Japanese warship is exercising along with a U.S. 7th Fleet uh, vessel that comes under attack, yeah, Japan can help defend the United States. Yeah. So 
he did all this without actually trying to, you know, open the Pandora's box of the Japanese constitution, even though I'm sure we all know that that was something that he wanted to do. Yeah, the pacifist constitution. So whatever his motives, um, he made some tremendous uh, changes. He, I mean, again, something you'll vividly remember, uh, did more than any Japanese prime minister before him to come to terms with the the reality and the truth of World War II. Yeah. Now, he, he didn't meet the high marks of uh, some of his neighbors and a lot of us in the U.S., but uh, you'll remember his speech to the Congress in 2015 at the 70th anniversary of the end of the war, uh, the, the joint visits that that he and Obama made that you will never forget. I will never forget. Yeah. First to Hiroshima and then to Pearl Harbor. Um, you know, these were really incredible things. But I, I'd go much beyond that, Ben, to say that um, Abe took a kind of faceless Japan and gave it a personality as far as the world was concerned. He took a Japan that was very inward looking and reached out not just uh, to neighbors, um, not just to say Southeast Asia, not just to the Pacific Islands or Australia, but reached out to India in a big way and helped to kind of drag India and Modi uh, deeper into the Western camp. He sort of conceived of this arc of freedom, this free and open Indo-Pacific he actually is, I think, legitimately one of the authors, if not the author of, of the Quad, at least of its early conception. That's Japan, the U.S., Australia, and India kind of having a regularized rhythm of, of coordination. Yeah. I mean, these are the four big major democracies in what's now called the Indo-Pacific. Um, I mean, it went through an awful lot of twists and turns, but... You know, his his brand, in a way, was not just Japan deserves respect. I want, you know, more status on the international stage, but working linkages, making and helping to build a kind of network. And I think the network served two purposes. One is he he was adamant about the importance of continued active uh, involvement by the United States in international affairs and in the Asia Pacific. And he was a big fan of the rebalance and he, he helped it in any number of ways. But secondly, and, and we really started to see this in the Trump administration, he harbored grave doubts about whether the United States was really up to the task, uh, whether the U.S. was uh, going to turn its back on Asia and, in effect, leave him uh, and Japan as the Fort Apache outpost of yeah. democracy in a pretty nasty world with a lot of, you know, commie bastard types. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and so he, you know, he did everything that he could think of to keep Trump uh, and the United States present and try to draw them back in. But he also created what to me looks like a kind of league of middle powers. And the Quad is part of that. The relationships that he built with Australia and with India, the partnership he established with the UK across the Atlantic, um, the work he did with uh, Southeast Asian countries and so on to um, build some kind of consensus around the regional governance and the rules of the road. Part of that, I think, was driven by a concern that there may not always be an America to serve as the counterweight to China, not always be an America that would serve as the guarantor of regional stability. And lastly, I think that's part of what drove uh, the push to modernize Japan's own defense capabilities and to develop some autonomous and indigenous uh, defense, what they call strike capabilities. 
Now, the good news is that they've done everything uh, in consultation with uh, the U.S. Uh, and as part of the alliance with an eye on maintaining interoperability so that we're working together and not at cross purposes. The bad news, as I said, is that part of what's driving them is the uncertainty. And now it's very graphic, the uncertainty about 2024 yeah. of whether there's going to be the kind of America left that will be there when democracies need it. What about, and just to, to make sure we're not, you know, we're covering, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly here. I mean, receive some criticism for, for brands of nationalism that in some view, you know, he was kind of had to be dragged into some of the reconciliation efforts with South Korea over comfort women, visits the Yasukuni shrine where there's some Japanese war criminals. What what did you make of his brand of nationalism? How how much of that was like a healthy evolution of Japan? How much of that was problematic, potentially ultra-nationalism? I mean, Abe was a mix. First of all, he was a mix of ideological nationalism uh, and extreme pragmatism. Yeah. So the fact that his heart was taking him in some direction that many Americans and many others find horrifying, yeah. um, but that in reality, his footsteps walked what ultimately was a tremendously constructive path. Yeah, this is my sense, too. I mean, yeah. that's part of the sort of contradiction yeah. uh, in in Abe. Um, he didn't get, thank God, he didn't get a lot of the things that he probably wanted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, he did harness that push and those desires uh, in ways that actually uh, worked well. Now, I mean, when it comes to history... First of all, um, Abe's views in many respects were controversial in Japan. And uh, there was great resistance, including in the sort of the middle of the road uh, political community, uh, to some of his ambitions with respect to militarization or revising the peace constitution and so on. But in other respects, he was smack dab in the middle of the Japanese consensus. Uh, you know, when it comes to history, the first thing you got to remember is that Japan is living in a very difficult neighborhood with very significant territorial disputes with, you know, China, with Russia, with Korea. The second thing is that, you know, there's a lot of baggage in all directions. History didn't start in the 20th century in Northeast Asia, right? The, yeah. these, some of these issues go back millennia. I would also say, Ben, you know, I spent my whole career overseas as a U.S. diplomat. And so some of what we saw in Abe and his kind of re reluctance to um, confront uh, some of the, the horrors of the former imperial uh, Japanese government in what seemed like uh, an objective way. Uh, it was not uncommon for the Japanese to hear more like, why can't you be like the Germans and yeah. kind of uh, accept responsibility? You know, but I got to say that as a, an American diplomat, um, I came pretty close to the edge more than once, you know, when, when foreigners were giving me sanctimonious lecture after lecture about American racism and slavery and Jim Crow and, you know, smallpox infected blankets, you know, to Native Americans and, you know, colonial role in the Philippines, firebombing Tokyo. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. I mean, there's some things that societies really have to come to terms with on their own. Yeah. And that pressure from the outside brings out the worst in them. And that was certainly true in Abe's case, and I think it's true for, uh, you know, many Japanese of his generation. You know, in Germany, the Third Reich was completely dismantled, and Nazism was categorically repudiated. And there was a break break there that I think, in many respects, enabled not only the Germans to come to terms with their uh, the reality of their history, but enabled neighbors like France and the Netherlands, where I've lived and worked, to also bring themselves to forgiveness. 
we didn't have that kind of break in Japan. The United States decided not to dismantle it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I think all of these things uh, were, you know, contributing factors to the the frustration and sometimes the repugnance that uh, a lot of Americans and others felt in listening to or talking to uh, Abe and and people uh, that were like minded with him. However. To your earlier point, when you look at what he actually did with respect to the so-called comfort woman agreement with the South Koreans that he reached in 2015, no, no question that President Obama played a very important role in facilitating it. But he did not grab the two leaders by the scruff of the neck and bang their heads together. This is something that they did. Uh, and I think that the fact that Abe was able to reach an agreement with President Park against a lot of his political and ideological instincts uh, is an important milestone. He, I know because he told me, he was deeply skeptical uh, that the Koreans were going to hold to the agreement. And he was very worried about being double-crossed. He, like many Japanese, felt that you know, the Koreans are a kind of victimhood, grudge society, and, you know, there's no number of apologies that's ever going to be enough for them. But he went forward with it in, I think, good faith. And uh, he then had to sort of live with the change of government, the Moon uh, administration, which did, in fact, repudiate it. But now... Um, we're back to a conservative government in Korea, and I think there's a real hope that uh, Japan and Korea can uh, can get back on track. Well, look, I, I think uh, you really helped us understand him, but through him, I, you know, Japan, and uh, uh, it's a good note to end on. And, and I think what you see, all these things you talked about, and you saw the LDP Abe's party obviously perform incredibly well in the recent election. You know, this is the orientation of Japan going forward. So it's a living legacy, um, that, that closeness with other countries in the region, Japan playing this bigger role. Um, so, uh, you know, the story is not over, um, even, even if it is tragically for, for Shinzo Abe. Danny, thanks so much for, for joining us. Really appreciate you uh, helping us uh, understand and unpack this. It's great to see you and talk to you, Ben. Thanks so much. Thanks again to Danny Russell for doing the show. Thank you, uh, John Bolton. Thank you, Condi Rice. Who else are we thank in here? John Elway. John Elway, although I didn't make up that quote yeah, in case yeah. anyone did catch that. Yeah. Um, John Bolton, man. Th Just th takes your breath away. Thanks to the, uh, like, I guess, thanks to, like, the former Oath Keeper guy that I saw testify. That, oh, that I didn't see some, all the hearings. That takes some guts, you know, like. Uh, the former Oath Keeper spokesman? Yeah, like, uh, the, you know. I wouldn't want to cross those guys. Uh, yeah, too yeah. Publicly. I was gonna say. I was. Little, I hope that guy's got you know some security. some witness protection. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we'll see. Thanks to the people in Sri Lanka who returned the fifty thousand dollars and cleaned up the presidential palace after they had a good party there. And the the dude who did a backflip, you nailed it. Thank you, man. Thank you. That that was a hell of a backflip. You are a golden god. Yes, for sure. <laughs> All right. Talk to you next week. <laughs>